1974, a Nigerian doctor with his German wife moved back to a small university town in Asuka. This was post-Civil War Nigeria. It must have been a tough place to be. But I had the most amazing childhood I could ever dream of. My sitting room was filled with people like Chinua Achebe, Professor Biechina, Prof. Sanya. They talked about the country they wanted to rebuild. There was barely any TV at the time. So I used to sit in a corner, listen to these men and women speak with vigor, speak about their dreams. And these are men that had options, that had moved back from the best universities in the world. They moved back to rebuild the country they loved. This is how my journey started. This is how I started dreaming about my own journey. But we all know that the continent was not filled with hope in the years afterwards from the structural readjustment program to everything that that led to, things became much harder. And truth be told, many people left. So the late 80s and 90s were a tough place to be in Nigeria, especially if you had parents that worked in the civil service or in universities and earned a fixed salary. So, you know, there was a lot of hope. And when our journeys progressed through secondary school and university, there weren't many figures that looked like us, that were successful, that we could look up to, to be like. So, <coughs> when the opportunity came, in 2007, to go to a conference in Arusha, Tanzania. And Ike and I were privileged to be one of a hundred Africans that were chosen to go to this place for a conference called TED. We had never heard about this conference at the time. But we're told it was like the mini Davos, somewhere you would like to be. And it was Tanzania. So we went with no idea of what was about to happen. In Arusha, we saw and met incredible Africans telling stories of what they were doing, of transformational ideas that they were leading. Now, this was way before the Africa Rising narrative. So, wow, we thought, gosh, how come we hadn't heard about all these people and all these stories and all these things? At that point, we knew something had changed in our lives. And the generally told story was that at the point we knew we would do TEDx Houston. But that was only half the story. We had no idea we would do TEDx Houston. We only knew we would do something. So, despite the excitement of Arusha, we all had lives. We had a mortgage, family, so we got over the initial buzz and moved back to the normal existence and continued pushing. Till 2009, Ted gave out licenses for the first time. And Ike and I thought, wow, what an opportunity to share what we had experienced. So we started planning 
for that first event. It was really a shot in the dark because you know, TED Talks were barely coming online. People really didn't know what it was. And we started calling up all these people to come to a conference called TEDx Houston. They asked us, what was TED? We said something called technology, entertainment, and design. I said, I have nothing to do with any of those topics. What do you want me to, be, what do you want me to speak about? So you can imagine calling Nasser Arufai. Sir, will you come to speak at this event? You know, he dropped the phone a couple of times. <laughs> but we persisted. We kept pounding the emails and doing the calls and ended up with an amazing lineup of speakers. So from Erufai to Nuhu Ribadu, Audrey Brown, the top BBC journalist that is in the room, Remy Adeshawun, who is also in the room, Chika Onigwe, who is also in the room, Shegu Aganga, a great lineup of speakers. We brought them together in this room at UCL to talk about the great work they were doing. It was an incredible day. You see, something happened in that room that have, I have never felt in any other event outside this TEDx Houston community. A connection between the audience and the speaker, where the audience wants the speaker to give a great talk. And the speaker wants the audience to feel his talk. To feel is not about PowerPoint slides or being a star. There was a chemistry almost like love, almost. <laughs> but gosh, when I look at those pictures today, man, our production was poor. <laughs> you know, the picture you see there, that's a picture from my living room. <laughs> I still have that picture at home. You know, we used to carry plants and uh, pictures and whatever we found to try and create a stage. But it was a special, special event. But still, we didn't think that we would go on to do 10 years of this. But we did. Year after year, this amazing team put together and found, searched, and found across the continent great people, great men and women doing amazing things and sharing their stories. People often ask me, what is your favorite TEDx Houston talk? What do you think is my favorite TEDx Houston talk? <laughs> it's an impossible question to answer. But you see, Today, when I want to tell my sons about the future and how they should behave, I reach out for Lola Shonain's beautiful talk about how to raise our children. When I'm looking for forgiveness, I reach out to Albi Sachs' talk when he talked about post-apartheid South Africa and what he had to go through, and what he gave. And he brought this entire community to tears. There wasn't a dry eye on the day Albi made that talk, gave that talk. When, I'm, when I want to, when I feel challenged about one small thing or the other that is bothering me, I think about Kobams and his talk on the gift of blindness. I think what hurdle could I possibly have that is more difficult than being blind? But yet he embraced this with so much grace. When I want to laugh, 
I pull up, I pull up Chi Girl. <laughs> I've watched it over and over again. It doesn't matter how bad your mood is, <laughs> you'll find something to laugh. When I think about feminism, I pull up. <laughs> you know, when Chimamanda gave that talk, and Beyonce picked it up and put it in the song, and it was published, people, a friend of mine called me and said, Chikwe, you don't hammer. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking that there was some way that the profit from that song <laughs> will flow to Chimamanda and somehow flow to us. <laughs> we said, no, it's not about anything like that. As we're to bring the people together, we're not interested in who owns your content or what you do with it. We want to share it with the world. So over the past 10 years, we have made you think. We've made you laugh. <laughs> we've made you cheer. And sometimes we've made you dance like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> and there will be some of it this night. <laughs> but there have been some sad days too and we reflected on some of them this morning. I mean, Pius. Pius told us that we were the future and said it in such a passionate way that I'm sure everyone left that room that day a believer. Binge brought us back to reality and made us face the reality that we as Africans and our communities are still not as inclusive as we need to be. He made that point before he uttered a single word. And Kamla. You know, after Kamla's talk, and when he passed away so shortly after that event, we got a message from his wife saying thank you. That we had done something special. That Kamla had spent his entire life, and those of you that will remember him, you remember his voice, his swag. <laughs> he spoke to presidents, rock stars, movie stars. But the content, his talk at TEDx Houston, was one of the few occasions that Kamla spoke about himself, his life, his view, and wishes for the continent, that it was a special gift for his children. So what's my special TED moment? We all have that special moment that we connect with the most. So going back to Arusha, I remember sitting in front, just like the beautiful ladies in front of me, in 2007. And this gentleman, Patrick Awa, who was then leading in a leadership position in Microsoft, spoke about his own journey and how he left Microsoft to move back to Accra, to Ghana, to start Aseshi University one of the first liberal arts universities in Africa. He had two young sons. He spoke about how important it was for him to engage at that point and how fulfilling it was and why he was in the place he needed, he needed to be. At that point, I knew in my heart that I could live with trying and failing but I couldn't live with not trying. So my journey back to Nigeria started mentally, but it still took a while <laughs> for the physical part to start. 
in between, I got an email randomly from work on a day asking me if I would take an opportunity to move to South Africa. <laughs> Man, South Africa wasn't on my horizons by any stretch of imagination. And I still wonder what my wife, Ijoma, felt when I came back that evening and asked her if she would like to move to South Africa with me. <laughs> but we did. We slept over it, spoke over it, and we took that opportunity to move to a completely new country. You know, South Africa is not yet the rainbow nation that we hoped it would be, but listen, neither is Nigeria, nor Ethiopia, nor Egypt. All our countries are work in progress, but we had four incredible years in SA, taking the good and the bad. My work took me across the country. My children engaged in two beautiful schools. My wife did an MBA and started work in corporate South Africa. We immersed ourselves in life in that country for four years, and we really enjoyed it. But in my mind, South Africa was not the destination. <laughs> it was a temporary stopover. It was extremely useful, but I was bent on getting to Nigeria. So my journey to Nigeria started, and it wasn't easy. People often call me now and say, Chikwe, I beg, organize a soft landing for me. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no soft landing in Nigeria, <laughs> none at all. If you want to come home, you have to come and join us in the struggle. <laughs> but still, there are ways to prepare. Many years before I actually moved, I took every single opportunity I could to do something small. These are pictures of small outbreaks I used to go back to work on whenever the opportunity came. So if, if there's someone in this room thinking about engaging, don't wait for the big bang. Start with every small step that you can. And don't go just for Christmas or for your friend's wedding, <laughs> because you will never get to see what it takes. Go and engage with that space that you work on and leave with. So now I'm home. It's definitely not perfect. And some mornings I still wake up and I think it's mission impossible. But there's nowhere else I'd rather be. Nowhere. When I was asked to take over the leadership of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control three and a half years ago now, people thought I must have connections at the top. I must have lobbied very hard. I didn't. Maybe I'm lucky, maybe I'm not, I don't know. My network definitely did play a role and that's one message I want to leave with you. Because networking is not that aggressive dishing out of business cards. It's a way of life, of giving more than you expect to get back. Give of yourself to others. That is what builds networks. My network definitely played a role in where I got to. I didn't know how, it wasn't planned, but it did. So, now I have the privilege of leading an organization where we're trying to redefine what it means, what public service 
means in Nigeria. I'm privileged to lead an incredible group of people that are trying very hard on very low salaries to do their very best. How is that going? Will be the talk for another day. <laughs> Maybe when the job is done. But I do ask you, any of you, when you're next in Abuja, please reach out. I'll ask one of them to take you on a tour of NCDC for you to see what is going on. You see, every time I go back to Nigeria and I happen to go back through Lagos and I pass getting through the Matala Mohammed International Airport, I am tempted, like I'm sure you are, to think, wow, this chaotic country, nothing will ever save us. But I ask you to engage a little bit more deeply because with the people I work with, I found out that there are millions of Nigerians waiting to be activated, waiting to be activated, that have never been pushed. And since we started pushing, they have joined me. And together, we're building a unique institution. Every week, almost every week, I get an email from someone that had traveled abroad for the first time, that had got his paper published for the first time, that is leading a project for the first time, that is owning his space. I have literally seen them transform into the leaders that Nigeria needs to take us to the next level. It's a journey I'm extremely proud of, but one that is not yet over. So if any of you in this room has that itch to go back and do something, I'll tell you something for free. It won't go away until you do something about it. Now, don't wait for the big bang, but start in small steps. This year, we hosted an intern. I saw a lot of 15, 16, 17 year olds today. The young lady is studying in Emory University in Atlanta. This was our first time coming home for Ni to Nigeria for an extended period. She was part of an internship program done at NCDC. She learned a lot, gave a lot. The day she was leaving, she came to my office. She came to my office to say thank you for the experience she had had with others. That day I knew we had won over one more so for a difficult country. But let me link this to that. What did I learn from the experience of TEDx Houston that has helped me with what we're doing at home at the moment? The most important lesson of many is when you have a great team, magic happens. Over the past, over the past 10 years, I've been privileged to work with this amazing group of people. Every year, Every year, we started the year in January looking for great Africans and people doing work in Africa. We look for great ideas worth sharing. But beyond curating this event, we became friends, 
we looked out for each other, solved each other's problems, became family. So whether it's, from, whether it's Felicia or Chooks, Nkem, Adugo, Femi, too many to mention. Thank you, guys. Thank you for creating something special. Is there, if there's any of you I shouted at during that journey, <laughs> I am sorry. <laughs> if I, I am sorry, deeply sorry. <laughs> but all of this happens on this journey when you're trying to create something that will live beyond you. So what's next? What's next? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> this is yours. We've got an archive of incredible ideas out of Africa that we are still spreading. We've got an incredible community with many more ideas that will be spread. What will we do with all of this? When will we move our ideas to action? This is our collective responsibility. The legacy of 10 years of TEDx Houston is you. Thank you very much.